ของพี่ยื่นมาประคองยื่นปลอบใจน้องเห็นน้ำตาคลอบเบา Hi everybody, thanks for joining me once again. This is Peter, and you're watching Thailand Bound. I'm using the same background behind me here as I used last week because a lot of people wrote in and said they actually like this, the nice uh, waterfall that you can see in the background. A few people wrote in and said where was the video taken. I don't actually know. It is definitely Thailand, um, but it's just a random video that was given to me uh, on a DVD with many other videos. Remember last week I'd actually said to you. Um, that I was going to put together a montage of funny photographs from Thailand from you guys. So I was actually asking you to send them in. So I've had a really good response to that. I've, I've had quite a few photographs sent to me. And just in case you didn't see that video, it's um, I'm, I'm planning to make a video. You know, you see these funny signs. They're, they're not quite spelt correct, or they're just funny pictures, things like that, or any funny images actually that you've taken yourself. Please don't send me any images that you've taken off the internet because one, I'll have probably seen them already anyway, and two, if I use them, I've, uh, there is a, a quite a high risk of YouTube giving me a strike against my account for using copyrighted material. Um, so you have to have taken the picture yourself. So I'm going to make that video for next Saturday. I normally prepare the videos around Monday or Tuesday. So if you want to send in a um, one of those, you know, one of your funny images, today's Saturday, obviously. So the cut off the deadline will be kind of Monday evening. If I haven't got, if you've sent it in by Monday, it'll go on to the video. After Monday, I probably won't be able to use it. Okay. Right, so what's today's video about? You know, normally I'm doing stories on a Saturday, but I feel the channel's getting a little bit stale with the stories. I know a lot of you guys write in and say you like them, and I am going to continue to do them, but I thought just for today's video and next week I'd do something a little bit different. So one of the questions I'm asked quite often, or suggestions, guys will write in to me and they'll say, why don't you make a video and tell us some of your experiences in Thailand, some of the things that you got up to or you've seen or things that stick out you remember? And I, and I write back to them and say, yeah, good idea, maybe one day. And I thought, I actually got a couple on last, last week, actually, an, another couple of emails, basically, or messages saying, you know, why don't you make a video with your experiences? And I thought, well, maybe now's the time. And I've been racking my brains. And... Um, I've come up with about 20, think, 20 things I remember here. Now, you've got to remember, guys, I, I lived in Thailand for many, many years. I've been visiting every year for the last three decades, near enough, 28 years, I think it is now. I was last there before the, um, you know, this pandemic hit last year. Can't believe it's a year, by the way. And um, I, as I say, I've gone, through, you know, I've, I've been racking my brains to kind of think what memories stand out. And I have come up with 20 things now. These on their own, none of them are, are particularly, um, you know, outstanding memories. But they're 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 my they're from me on a personal basis. So they might not be important to other people, but I am satisfying the request that you guys have sent in, saying, you know, why don't you tell us some of your experiences? Which is what I'm going to do in today's video. So just to reiterate once again, there the, these are actually my personal memories, and these are just things I remember thousands of things, obviously over the years. But these are twenty things that kind of stick out in my mind. I don't know why these twenty things, but they do. And as I read through them, then you know maybe they'll make sense. So let's just kick straight off, and I'll, I'll go through the twenty. So my my first memory is about a guy called Neville. And do you, if you're familiar with Nana Plaza, there's a um, a, a huge bar. It used to be called the Carousel on the third floor. I think it's called Billboard now. As you walk in, uh, there's there's a kind of jacuzzi on the right and a revolving stage on the left. Well, back in the day, it was two stages. The, the big one on the left was revolving as you're walking through the door, and the one on the right was just a small standard stage. And the reason I, the particular the reason I remember this guy called Neville because he was just so tight. He was like you know you meet cheapskates all over Thailand a lot of the time, but this guy he'd win a medal for it. I mean, he was unbelievably tight. And the reason I remember him is because I, when I went in there, I'd be drinking with a group of friends and we'd always stand um, at the bar that served the drinks. I think there was a couple of bars back then, but it was the one as you go through the door, the one on the right, we'd be standing there and, you know, we'd be we'd be talking to each other and enjoying the evening. This guy, as, you know what it's like, you, you're buying drinks, you buy a round. So if there's eight people there, you have to buy eight drinks in those days. Let's just say in these days, that's, you know, you're talking about maybe 1,200 but um, it's a lot of money, but for one round, but you know, um, everybody's fair, everybody's going to buy their round, so it works out about the same anyway. The reason I remember him is because what he'd do, when it was his turn to buy a, a drink, he'd, 
walk backwards, pretend he was looking up at the stage, be smiling at the girls, and he'd disappear behind the carousel, the one that moved round, and you didn't think nothing of it, and he'd come back with a full glass of beer. And this went on for quite a while before I actually um, before I actually clicked what was going on. And what he was doing, he was accepting a beer from everybody when it was, uh, you know, their rounds. And when it was his turn, he'd sneak off, but make out he was just looking at the stage, going to the toilet. And then he'd buy his drink from the other bar and hopefully nobody had noticed. And that guy just stands out in my mind because that, it was just, um, I don't know, it's, <laughs> let's move on. Okay, so my, my next memory is of the East Inn Inn in Soy 8 Patia. It used to be, it's now called the Easterny Hotel. It used to be called the Easterny Inn. I was one of the first guests that actually stayed at the, when it was called the Easterny Inn. It opened around 89, 90, something like that. So let's say 30 years ago. And in those days, if you know Soye, as you're walking up from the beach, the Easterny uh, Hotel as it is now, which was the Easterny Inn, is on the left. There's a subway there, but in back in the day, that used to be a, uh, a small travel agents. And... The memory I've got of this Eastern Inn Hotel, other than it being a real nice hotel because it was new, modern, and I was one of the first to stay there. I was first in the room that I actually stayed in. The reason I remember it is because in those days, back in the early, early 90s, I used to do quite a lot of work on the internet, and it was when the internet the internet was quite new and if you remember if you're old enough to remember some of you younger guys watching this you won't know what I'm talking about but it's called dial-up everything's broadband now but when the internet first started they had something called dial-up and you actually had to dial into a uh, dial into the system you know I feel like a dinosaur talking about this but you know back in those days in Patia you couldn't most hotels you couldn't get a direct line out of the hotel you had to dial nine you'd get the operator and say, could you dial this number for me, please? It was really, it was like that. And it was so frustrating for me and a friend who also worked on the internet. We went from Bangkok to Patti together. And it was so frustrating because we used to spend, especially in the early days, we'd, we'd just spend a whole day walking to each hotel. Have you got direct line from the, from the phone in the room? No, you have to go through the operator. Next hotel, same thing. And eventually you might find somewhere. But the thing about this Easter Inn, why I remember it, why it was so funny is because we checked in and on this, um, I had my laptop with me, but on this particular weekend, I didn't need to get on the internet. So I didn't ask, um, do you have direct line? It was just a new hotel, decided to stay there with my friend. And, um, you know, one, I think it was Saturday afternoon. I thought I'll just, I'll try, I lift, tried the phone and wow, direct line. But then I faced the other problem, which was how do you connect to it? Because there's no wiring, there's no, you know, you didn't have all the sockets and plugs like you have today. And believe it or not, to get on the internet, what I did, I pulled the bed away from the wall I went out and bought a razor blade or a pack of razor blades. I spliced the wire, the telephone wire, uh, the telephone wire, um, exposed the two wires. I think they're red and green or red and brown, red and blue maybe, I don't know. I had to peel back the um, wire from those th really thin wires with a razor blade until it exposed the copper or whatever it was. And then from my laptop, I'd have a piece of wire going into the laptop. And then I did the same thing at the end of that one, but then I'd have two hooks of wire and I'd hook them on. And that's how I got onto the internet from the Eastern Ian and Soya and Patia. So that, that's something I remember. That's quite a memory. Okay, let's move on. Uh, next one. This is something that still happens now, but it's just, um, I just remember back then thinking how, how many people smash bottles on people's heads. And I'm not talking about um, foreign ties on foreigners only. I'm talking about ties on ties, ties on foreigners. And I've seen this, I've seen probably three incidences where a tie has just walked up to behind somebody and just smashed a Heineken bottle over the back of their head. And it just, it just kind of sticks in my memory because it's just something you don't really see too much in the UK. Um, what the last one I remember, I was I was coming, I, I was staying in Soy Four at the uh, Nana Thai Mansion. It's right next to the Tobacco Factory, and on this particular day, it was very very hot. I think it was about forty degrees. I was going over to see my friend who lives in Bangwa. It's about twenty minutes on the BTS, but I didn't fancy changing stations and going up the stairs. It was real hot. I thought I'll go to the end of Soy Four, grab a taxi, and it's about half an hour, forty minutes, and I'll, you know, it's about two hundred baht. I'll just do it that way. And I was, it was in the afternoon this, I was walking past Nana Plaza on the opposite side of the road and this, he almost looked like a hobo slash tramp, but he was Thai, you know, he had dirty old flip flops, his hair was down here dirty, looked like it hadn't been washed for months, he had, you know, really um, dirty clothes on. And he was in front of me and this Thai lady and she, middle, probably about 40, 
but she was obviously um, a cook on one of the noodle stands because she, you know, she had the hat and the apron and everything. So I don't know what this guy had done. I imagined he'd asked for food and she said no or didn't give him what he wanted and he swore her or something. I'm just assuming. Anyway, this um, woman, this lady who, <laughs> who works on the food cart or owns a food cart, she's just come running past me and bang on the back of this guy's head. And it took him about three seconds to realize what had happened. He rubbing his head, thought about it, looked back and ran down the road after her. But by that time, she, you know, she was long gone. Uh, there was another time in uh, one of the bars in, I'll just tell you one more. I won't tell you three stories, um, but there, you get the idea. But there was, you know, as you walk into Nana, the rainbow bar right in the corner, I forget which one it is, but it's a big one right in the far corner. And uh, I remember been in there one one night with a friend and we were sitting on the uh, the tier seating and we just watched this guy he was sitting on the other side of the stage and he'd had words with some of the girls and we didn't think nothing of it and as he was walking out we just i don't know why i was watching him for some reason just followed him out <laughs> and a girl come running up behind him and just smashed him again with a heineken bottle okay so some of these memories that i have from thailand they're not all good in those days when i lived in thailand i used to drive all over thailand um from up north right down to Patio and all the rest of it. And this one particular weekend, it was a bank holiday, uh, some kind of a holiday in Thailand, but it wasn't a holiday where they close the bars. It was a holiday where they, um, you know, a lot of Thais go down to the uh, beach towns, foreigners as well, whoever. Anyway, so on this particular trip, I was driving and I had a friend with me and we were stuck on the Sukhumvit Road coming into Patio. It was real heavy traffic and we were crawling along and you couldn't go forward, you couldn't go backwards. It was just typical, typical traffic. We weren't sat still all the time, only when the lights were red, but you were crawling slowly, slowly, edging your way into, into Patia. And on this particular trip, you know those big um, old fashioned lorries that they have, they, they bellow out so much pollution. It's, they wouldn't be allowed on the roads in any other country, but you know, in, in Southeast Asia, it seems to be quite a common thing, not just Thailand, but these trucks uh, bellow out this, um, you know, all this pollution. So anyway, so I'm in the middle lane and this truck's on the left of me and it's slightly in front of me and that's crawling along. along. And one of these street dogs that I'm always talking about, one of these old street dogs was crossing the highway. It was just walking like it didn't have a care in the world, didn't, um, you know, didn't care about the traffic, walked under this truck and the truck started to go forward and caught the dog, but it didn't run over it full on. It kind of just caught the back end of it. I can't, I don't know how to explain it, if its tail got trapped or whatever, but the truck actually ran over the back of this truck, crushed this dog's legs and tail and the back end of it. And it was, it was awful. This dog was, I've never heard an animal cry out in pain. And what made it so awful was you couldn't do anything about it. You couldn't get out your car and bang it on the head with a lump of wood. You couldn't, uh, you know, I didn't have a gun, so I wasn't going to shoot it. No tie, ties did anything about it. This poor animal, it was, it, it, obviously it would have died, but it was laying in the road, back end crushed. It was an absolutely agony. And the, the howls, the shrieks that this dog let out are still in, still in my mind today. And this has gone back sort of 25 years, so 20 years maybe. So that, that's a horrible, horrible one. Uh, but you did ask me what things I remember about Thailand. So that's one of them. Okay, here's another one. This, right, there's no more gruesome ones like that one, but there's a few nasties in there. And this one's, um, this didn't happen to me, but it was something I witnessed. So when I was in Thailand, I spent close to three years, two to three years in uh, Konken. And if you don't know where Konken is, it's in Isan. And I'm talking around 1990. So right now, um, Konken is a, a major, major city in Isan. I think there's about four major cities up there. But back in the day, 30 years ago, it wasn't, it was large. It's never been, it wasn't a small village or a small town. It was still large, but it wasn't like it is today. I mean, you didn't have shopping malls. Um, the highways weren't as, you know, it, the, the infrastructure wasn't as good as it is today. And it was very much still rural, although it was quite a big town. And I went up there with a team to open a hotel in those days, I, you know, I've got hotel uh, background. So we were, we were, uh, we went up to Conkent to open a brand new hotel. And because it was a, because the hotel was being built and we were um, involved in the planning of, you know, restaurants and everything as it was um, being built, we stayed in a small Thai hotel. And obviously it was a nine to five job in, in the hotel industry. You know, you, you can do 18 hour days. There's no such thing as a nine to five or a regular day off. But in those days, because we were part of the opening team of the hotel, we were doing kind of eight till five or nine till five, something like that. Went out to dinner together. Then you were free in the evening to do what you wanted to do. 
And I remember there was one area where they had a clump of bars and, you know, I was quite young in those days. Well, not young, I was a lot younger than now. I think back then, this era where I'm talking, I think I was about 30, 31. And um, we used to go out to this cluster of bars, nothing special. It was a bit like, I'm just trying to think of an example in um, Bangkok. I can't think of one, but it was a cluster of small bars, but it was somewhere to go, it was a lot of fun, you know, and uh, we sat around drinking. Now, part of the um, team who were opening this hotel, there was a an independent company who we'd brought in who were experts in sound and lighting because this particular hotel had a, a karaoke, a disco and all this, and this um, other company were brought in to install all the sound equipment, lighting equipment and all this sort of thing. So one of the guys on this team, about my age, he used to come out with us and we're sitting around um, drinking. There was also a Thai equivalent to whatever they were. So if you had an expert in lighting, you'd have the Thai guy who was an expert or so-called expert in Thai. And the same with the, um, you know, all, all the other positions for whatever they did. So this one particular night, I know this is quite long-winded, I do apologise, but I, I've got to really explain it. If it's boring, you just go forward or, you know, but I, I'm not going to skip. I'm going to give you the full details so you understand it. So on this particular night, we went out drinking and we were all, we probably had a bit too much to drink. And the electrician who, um, I can't remember which country he come from, but he was obviously a foreigner. He was kind of teasing the Thai uh, electrician, which he, should, he shouldn't have done really, but they were both drunk, very drunk. And they were kind of arguing about bits and pieces and you should do it this way. No, you should do it that way. And the Thai obviously didn't want to lose face in front of the other Thais. And the foreign guy, he was quite an expert at what he did. And I think he was starting to make him lose face in front of the other Thais. And all of a sudden, the, the, the Thai electrician disappeared for half a minute. He came back and he had what looked like a Colt 45 in his hands. He poked it in the face of this white guy and just basically said something like, say another word. And uh, he was quite stupid. He did. He started, continued to argue with him. And the guy just, he, he just went off. He didn't shoot him. But we, I still know the guy. And we look back on it and we think, how stupid. You know, I mean, you could have been dead. You could have been shot there and then. He wasn't. But that was just through through luck. Okay. Right. Okay. This, this is a short one. But this is something that stands out in my memory because it's very unusual. I was driving, um, I think I'd been to Mabu Kong or somewhere like that. And I was driving back to the Sukhumvit area. And I was coming past Siam Square, around that area, on one of the major roads. And um, <clears throat> this is when they were building the BTS, the SkyTrain. And as I was driving, I looked up on one of the gantries and they had the, you know, the workers, they're covered because they don't want to get suntan. They're covered and they have females and they have males. And you could see, so I'm, I'm just stuck in traffic. I'm looking up like this and I see a female next to the uh, one of the guys. He's working away. And you can see she's got a ponytail, so obviously a female. She just, <laughs> she's just next to him. She just, with her left hand, she just grabs his backside and starts squeezing his, his you know, his backside. And although that isn't, a, you know, a huge story, it's just something that sticks out in my mind. It was very unusual because you see construction workers all over Thailand. And to see uh, a female <laughs> grab the backside of a male was, you know, just, just sticks out in my mind. Okay. Uh, right. This one, a couple, right. A couple of my earlier videos on the channel where I'm telling you stories, I'm not reading them, I'm telling you them because I know them from first-hand experience. Some of them videos um, are from experiences that I know from friends or I've witnessed myself. And, you know, talking about things that I remember from Thailand, um, this is one I made a video about. But basically, it was... Um, a guy, he came to Thailand with the intention of doing some business, making a business, and to, we'll cut, I'll cut this one short. He lost all his money, and he kept saying, well, when I get to this much, I'll head back home if it doesn't work. And then when he, his money would go down further, then he'd set himself new goals. And eventually, he got to the point where he thought, I'm going to throw the dice and gamble all every penny I got because I know it's going to happen. It didn't happen. He, he had a bar friend, a bar girl, girlfriend that he'd been paying money to, sending her money and uh, you know, the usual sort of thing. And he lost everything and he, 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 he would have been out on the street. And believe it or not, this girl actually took care of him. You know, she still went out to work. Um, you know what I mean by work. So she lived, he moved into her Thai room. She went out to work. She bought shopping and he survived for a few months like that. And eventually he got himself sorted out. He did manage to get a good job. Uh, and he, he looked after, he rewarded her after that. I don't, they didn't, stay together as far as I know. Um, but that is a very, very true story. And there is a video on that story. I, I can't remember which one it is now. You'll have to go through the older videos. Okay, here's another one, the video. Uh, it's one I, I based, you know, the, the, the stories that I tell myself are based on true stories. Now, this is another uh, 
memory that stands out for me, and it was a, it's tragic, tragic actually. And at the time, it was um, well, it was just horrible. But I had a friend. He went to Thailand. He'd not been out there before, or he'd been out there several times before actually. And he'd met this girl, and he fell in love. And you know, Patia girl, Patia Bargo, you know the sort of thing. I'm not going to get into great detail here, but. He thought he'd met the girl of his dreams. He, she'd persuaded him to go home, sell his house. So he was going to come back to Patia, um, open a bar. It's just what Patia needs, isn't it? Another bar. But anyway, um, he did all that. And to cut a long story short, as I like to say, he she had a Thai boyfriend and they basically threatened him and got rid of him basically and said, you know, you show your face around here and you're dead sort of thing. Checked into a hotel on the beach road and he basically threw himself off off a balcony and killed himself so you know and I knew that guy he was a very very good friend of mine and that at the time it was um, devastating so obviously I remember that okay this is one that embarrassed me and I don't know why it shouldn't have embarrassed me but it did at the time I remember I was uh, Sukhumvit Road again so you know the white bridges for pedestrians to um, cross over it was a lot different back then I'm talking 20-30 years ago they've got wire um, between in the middle of the carriage where you can't what I'm trying to say is you can't walk from one side of Sukhumvit Road to the other side of Sukhumvit Road without using a uh, what we call in the UK zebra crossing you know um, or a um, a bridge but in those and, and they've got signs on the wire saying 200 baht fine if you get caught but in those days you could actually just cross the road you, you know you'd look at night late at night and you just run across the road um, but the, for some particular reason I was crossing Sukhumvit Road and it was quite busy it was about five o'clock and it was near Soye, around that sort of area, where they used to have all the, uh, or was it Soy 7? You know the German beer garden? It was uh, near, that, just after there, around there anyway, it doesn't matter. But there's a bridge there. And I went over and there was a white guy sitting in the middle of this bridge with a sign written in English and in Thai. And, it basically, and he had a bowl in front of him and it basically said, um, please give generously, need ticket to get back home. And obviously this was in Thai. And... It just didn't register with me. When I first seen it, I thought it was a joke. You know, I mean, he's a white guy begging in the middle of Bangkok. And as it began to sunk in, I stopped at the end of the bridge, looked back at him, and I thought, and, it, and then it finally registered. It clicked. This guy had somehow lost all his money. He'd spent all his money, or he'd gambled and thought he was getting more money. It didn't happen. He was, he was desperate, and he was on this bridge, and he was begging Thais and foreigners for money. And, and I remember a deep feeling of shame. I don't know why. It was nothing to do with me, but I just that was in the days where. It's a lot different now, but, uh, you know, I don't know if I should say this, but the Thais, they kind of respected foreigners a lot more than they do today. Um, I won't get into it, but uh, they did. And to see this guy begging on a bridge, it just made me feel totally ashamed. And it shouldn't have done because it was nothing to do with me, but there you go. Okay, <laughs> now this, this next one, it actually touches on the video I'm going to do next Saturday, which is, you know, I've asked you to send in all these uh, funny pictures you might have taken in Thailand or funny signs. And it's just... Um, this is something I remember. Now, these are signs that they put in massage parlor windows or shop windows or wherever. And they were they put these signs up as serious signs. They weren't meant to be a joke. They're translated into English or they're written in English, but they're, they're meant to be serious signs. And some of these signs, you read them and they just, you know, <laughs> they just make you laugh. Or they did me anyway. And I'll give you an example of one because this video isn't about funny signs. But I was work at that time I was staying in Soy 24 at the time in a building called Sahai Place, still remember it. But I remember going down there and it's, um, it's 22, 22, because they've got all the massage shops down there. And I remember walking down there and they have these little crazes and if somebody does it and it works, they all do it. And I remember these signs in the window of these massage shops, and I'm not joking, they actually said, testicle massage and that was serious they were basically saying go in and have a you know one of them and that was meant as a serious um sales pitch and i i just find things like that quite funny um okay here's another memory this one sticks out a bit do you know when you when you travel around thailand you stay in small hotels and they provide water but uh, beers uh, snacks and things like that but they're always overpriced aren't they if you there's normally a 7-eleven in the same street or nine times out of ten across the road and I remember um, I did this very often I I'd check into a hotel I'd need a, a, you get free water but sometimes you forget to get it the next day you've run out of water you've been out drinking and you you know your, your tongue's like a, an Arab's sandal sort of thing <laughs> and uh, you'd need a drink there and then so you'd, you'd take the, the the water that they were selling in the fridge drink it and then you'd go out and buy one from 7-eleven take this label off and put it back in the fridge and they were none the wiser and I used to do that very often but this memory sticks out in uh, in my mind for one reason that I didn't actually do it in this time I, I checked into this hotel in Patia 
and it, before the East Indy Inn or the East Indy Hotel, whatever you want to call it now. And um, I checked into this hotel and I didn't actually do that. I went out and uh, I drank their water and I bought more water. But as I was checking out, they actually charged me for this water. And I said, I said, no, I'm not paying for it. I never bought it. And I really hadn't, you know, I mean, I've just told you that I had done in other hotels, but I don't know why they, they said, oh yeah, this one's got some special blue label underneath. And if you buy it from outside, we know. And you know, I could have turned it into World War Three, but as I'm always saying to you, you know, it's better in those situations, just, you know, pay it and walk away. What, how much are you talking about? A couple of hundred baht? It's not going to break the bank. I know it's wrong, but sometimes it's an easier option. Um, so that was quite a strange one. Um, another memory. Okay, so a friend of mine said to me one day, he said, have you ever eaten, I'm not going to name the restaurant because that would be unfair. There is, or there was quite a famous restaurant in Pat Pong and I, I won't even tell you why it's famous because uh, I just don't want to expose if they're still there it's not fair on them but my friend had said to me have you ever been to this restaurant and I said no I haven't he said it's very very good let's go and have a meal there and so we went to have a meal there and it, um, <laughs> I nearly let on there what we were having but anyway we went there and halfway through the meal and this is just <laughs> the reason I remember this is it's just something you wouldn't see in the UK Somebody will probably write in and say they've seen it, but it's not normal. But I'm sitting there eating, and I'm on the main course. We're talking to each other. I look up, <laughs> and the beam that runs along the wall, the top of the beam there, a rat just sitting there, scratching itself, looking around, didn't, couldn't give a damn. And uh, <laughs> I just remember that. It stands out in my memory because that's something that's, um, you know, normally if you see a rodent, it's scurrying away. But to be, and the restaurant was full on a Saturday night. So to be sitting there just having a scratch, it was <laughs> quite unusual. And I remember that. Okay, how many we got now? Uh, about six. Okay, so this is quite a humorous one. I remember uh, in the in the time I'm talking about, I could speak quite a bit of Thai back then. Uh, I could speak more now, but back then I, I didn't speak as much, so I could hold a conversation, but it was kind of broken English, broken Thai. And I had a friend who worked in Thailand, and he'd been working there for many years, and he spoke absolutely fluent Thai. He had a Thai wife, and he could read Thai, and he was... He was, you know, he's a foreigner, but he might as well be in Thai. He, he spoke really, really good Thai. And we went to Mabu Kong one time, and we, he was looking at laptops, and we went, and then we, we'd done that, and we went to buy something else. And he, we went into this one shop, and he wanted to buy a T-shirt. And a lot, of the shops, they, a lot of the shops in Thailand, they don't put the prices on things because they like to negotiate. So if you're one person, you say how much, they'll tell you one price, and somebody else, they'll tell a different price. That's how it works, especially in markets. And uh, my friend and myself, we went into this... Um, clothes shop in Mabu Kong, no prices. And my friend, he didn't, he, he said it in, in English. I don't know why he didn't speak Thailand, but he actually said, how much is this t-shirt? Like, how much is it? And before he had time to answer, the owner who was there, a guy, old, uh, old guy, with his young Thai assistant, like the shop worker, he actually said to her in Thai, okay, charge this guy four times what we normally sell it for, but let him barter it down to double the price. So in other words, if it was 100 baht, the owner had said to him, uh, said to the girl, okay, the real price is 100 baht, tell him it's 400 baht, but if he barters, let him have it for 200 baht, but no less sort of thing. And my friend turned around, he said, what the f*** are you saying that to a four? Which obviously shocked him, and I suppose he lost face, but he, he turned around and said something in Thai, like, oh no, you're one of us, you speak the same language, and uh, you can have it for the same price. And I, I think it was laughed off in the end, because, you know, the worst thing you can do in Thailand is make someone lose face, and we, you know, we don't want to make people lose face, but that was, that's uh, quite an interesting story. Um, okay, so this is one, you know, in a lot of the videos in the past, I've said to you, look, don't mess about with the ties, go there, enjoy it, don't try to force your own ways on them. If you're not happy about something, just walk away. Well, this, this story is a good example. So again, I'm not going to name the bar. I'm just going to say it's one of the outside bars of Nana Plaza. And you know, as you walk in, they, I don't know if they still do actually, but they used to park all the motorcycles along the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And one of those bars got a new manager and he, he, he was trying to, um, you know, look good, look, do something. I don't know what he's trying to do. But anyway, he told the Thais, uh, you can't park your motorcycles there anymore. Now, bear in mind, they've been parking motorcycles there since day one, you know, probably 25 years they've been parking their motorcycles there. Or that's where, you know, they've got to park somewhere, haven't they? And he came along and he put up some cones and some plastic tape and all the rest of it. And when they challenged him, he was like, no, no, new owner, new, uh, new management, whatever it is, you can't park your bikes. Customers can't see, they can't get to the bar, you're blocking the entrance. And he stood firm and, he, you know, he thought he'd doing the right thing. Anyway, I happened to be there that night, but I was in the opposite bar. And a bunch of about 20 Thai guys came in there. Uh, 
put the motorcycles there, snapped the tape and everything. He came out and they just beat him up on the spot. You know, I mean, it's, it's understandable. You know, you don't, you can't, you can't go along to uh, somebody in a, it's their country, it's not yours, and tell them you can't park your motorcycles there. So, um, you know, you don't forget things like that. Okay, this is quite a funny one. This is, um, I was in Pat Pong years ago. There's bars above the regular bar. So as you're walking down Pat Pong, you've got all the go-go bars, you've got the night bazaar, the night market in the middle, but they have doorway. I, I'd never go into them now because they're real rip-off places. But as you're going along in between the go-go bars, you might have an opening, a doorway, and you'll have a tout there. And he's like, oh, this show, that show. And he'll have a card with him. And I went up to one of these shows. Um, there was, we went up to one of these um, uh, shows upstairs above one of these bars in Pat Pong. And rubbish really and as we're coming out I got to the top of the stairs just started walking down looked down and I seen a cockroach about the size of my thumb here and it went under my collar of course I, I had no experience of this and I just went into utter utter panic ripped my shirt off and I, believe it or not I was running through Pat Pond Market swinging my shirt with nothing on top and all the ties on the market and everything they were laughing you know they're really laughing and pointing at me look at that idiot you know and I suppose I looked like one wasn't I but you know when you when you get a a cockroach the size of your thumb crawling behind your neck and you're not used to it then yeah you know I ripped my shirt off and I ran for it but anyway uh okay now the next one this is a uh, this is a really good memory when you hear me tell you this you're going to think it's quite childish and I suppose it was but we had a great night a fantastic night and it was a friend uh, it was when I lived in Patia, a friend and myself, we went on the internet and we seen this product, they were called, um, from America actually, and we got them delivered to Thailand, it took about six weeks at that time, but they're called Billy Bob Teeth, and what they are, there's a website, it's an American company, and what they are, they're like, a, they're like false teeth that look really real, and you put them under your gum, and when you look at them, they look like real teeth, but they're, they're really manky. I mean, they're goofy. You got you can buy different ones, you know, with a uh, like a gold one or a black one or teeth. I mean, they're just ugly, ugly. You know, you look like, um, what do they call them in, in America? Hilly, hilly billies, is it? Oh, I can't remember. But, you know, these people who live up in the mountains with, uh, I think you know what I'm trying to explain. Anyway, we both bought a pair of these for a laugh and like yeah it, it was childish but we stuck them in and they look really funny I mean we, we couldn't stop laughing for about 20 minutes when we put them in ourselves so we took them out with us that night and we decided we went to the marina disco and in those days the marina disco was the place to be it's it's walking street it's up the there's an escalator um next to the Thai boxing and you go up there and I was in there about a year ago actually just having a look around uh for nostalgia more than anything and it, it's nothing compared to what it was they got pool tables around the outside now but in those days it was absolutely rammed to the it was jam-packed because when the sort of around three o'clock all the girls that worked in the bars in patio they'd all pile in there all the uh, foreigners are piling there all the holiday makers everybody and it was packed and on this particular night we had these billy bob teeth that was so funny i wish i had a set to put in now to show you but we um, we were walking around and you could clo just about close the mouth and hide them, but obviously you'd, they'd be protruding, but it's quite dark, isn't it? And what you'd do, you'd walk up to somebody in there and stick your hand out like you want to shake your hand. And of course they want to shake your hand for obvious reasons. So they stick the hand out smiling and then you give this big smile with these Billy Bob teeth sticking out. And I know, you know, I keep saying it sounds childish and it probably was, but you know what? We had one of the best nights we've ever had out and we just had, I remember coming home and I, I'd been laughing so much. My ribs were actually hurting. When I woke up the next day, it felt like I'd been punched in both sides of the ribs. But anyway, that's that, you know, you said, what do I remember about Tana? That's one of the things I remember. Silly, I know, but it was good fun. Um, okay. What, what else? Ferme Cafe and the night crawlers. So if you live in Thailand or you're a uh, Bangkok or you're a regular, you'll know about Therme Cafe. It's been there since I think it was 1965. And I just remember I'd been out with a friend. We'd had a meal. We'd been to Nana. We'd been to Cowboy. We'd been to, uh, we'd been everywhere. And it was about three, four in the morning. And this, this is in the days where the bars used to stay open to 5.30 in the morning. I've, I've come out of Therme at six o'clock in the morning. They used to stay open all night. Now I think it's two o'clock. And, um, so my friend and I, we went out and I was, abs and this is when I was in Kong Ken. So I'd come down for the weekend. He took me out. And uh, so it must've been in the real early days. And he, um, I, <laughs> about four, four o'clock in the morning, I was absolutely, you know, tired. I'd been, you know what it's like, you're sweating when you're walking around these bars. 
and I, would be, I was drunk. And I said to him, look, I want to go back to the whole town. I'm going to have a shower, sleep. I'm, I'm knackered kind of thing. You know, I'm really tired. And he said, look, let's just go to one more. And I said, we'll make it somewhere quiet where we can sit down, have a bit of peace and quiet because I'm, I'm really tired. He says, yeah, 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 this place is real quiet. And I tell you what, he took me in there and I thought I'd gone into, um, I can't even think of the word, but this place was packed to the rafters. And the sort of people back then that were in there are not like the people who are in there now. This, it's it's um, you'll see a lot of Japanese and Korean guys in there now. It never used to be, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, like I'm saying it's bad because they're there, but what I'm saying, it was just a different clientele. But what was funny about it was, there was lots of funny things about it. I mean, if you went, they had a back entrance in those days, and I remember you go, you go to the toilet, and you know, people are coming and going, coming and going, no privacy whatsoever, and right here was a kitchen. So they're, they're cooking, you're having uh, a pee, and people are walking past you, just totally um a, a different kind of zone so i remember that and the other thing i remember about it you'd have i suppose four or five hundred people in there maybe 300 i don't know absolutely packed but they didn't provide any music there was a jukebox and if nobody put any coins in the music you'd hear this this uh all these people speaking and it was just you know uh, you couldn't understand anything unless you were actually talking to that person but all you could hear was voices and then a girl had decided to put some money in a jukebox and you'd have a couple of songs and then it'd go quiet again so I remember that and obviously I remember coming out at sort of six in the morning and it was daylight and all the tires were going to work and I'm thinking you know <laughs> what sort of a life am I am I living here is this normal um okay now the next one this is uh this is a really stupid thing you know you know you do we've only got three more now you know, sometimes you do things in life and you look back on it and, you know, you shake your head and you think, how could I have been so stupid? You know, I could have killed myself or I could have, you know, I could have got, you know, we have all had thoughts. I remember being in Patty with a friend of mine. I was driving. I had a um, an old BMW back then. I can't remember what series it was. I think it was a Series 5 because it was quite big, but it was an old one. Anyway, we'd been drinking and we were in Jumped In and just for fun, I don't know what come over us. I decided that we were going to go down to the end of Jump in and we were going to do handbrake turns. Yep, that's it. You heard me correctly, handbrake turns. And, I, you know, now bearing in mind, I was absolutely drunk. My friend was absolutely drunk. You know what it's like in Thailand. You get people wandering about all hours of the day and night. So I went, you know, it wasn't this end of Jump in where um, when you first get to, it was a far end to be fair. But, you know, we'd start off get it up to about sort of 40, 50 handbrake. I was doing handbrake turns. You know, you could hear the screeching. Well, you know, can you imagine the consequence if, if I'd have hit somebody, if I'd have killed somebody? So obviously I can't forget that. That was a real stupid thing to do. A hands up, I admit it, but that's that's something that stands out. Um, and I'm going to end on a, on a nice one, guys. I'm not going to end on a real gruesome one, but I've got two more. Um, and this is something that stands out. Um, a barrister, if you're not English, a barrister is like a um, an attorney in America, but a very a high up one, you know, they're, they're sort of the, the top of their profession. And I remember in Nana Plaza, there used to be a barrister who, or an ex-barrister who owned um, a bar and it wasn't even a nice bar. It was one of these really sort of smelly, pokey little bars. And you'd go in and I was introduced to him and he was like, he'd speak like the, um, you know, like a QC, Queen's Council. I mean, with a plum in his mouth, he, even for me, he just sounded like, it, it, you just couldn't gel because you had this guy, oh, he's an ex-barrister and I don't know what the hell he did to be not be a barrister anymore and now be running this uh, shitty little bar. But, you know, anyway, that's something I remember. OK, on to the last one. And this is quite a nice one. So back in those days, when I was working in Konken, I was driving. And what I used to do, I used to drive from Konken in Isan down to central Bangkok. And in those days, the traffic, it used to take me about six hours. There wasn't a lot of uh, food options on the way, you know, McDonald's, pizza, that sort of thing. It was all kind of Thai um, shacks, really, I suppose. They are, they're just small huts on the road, but you could get something to eat. And I remember this one particular, um, this one day, I can't remember what day it was, but I went down and there was a place that I'd, I'd stop off regularly. It was about two and a half hours into the journey. Uh, there was about three or four um, huts there, then they serve, you know, you could get some fish, rice, um, some bits and pieces, but you could, you could have a meal anyway for quite cheaply, 20, 30 baht. And on this particular reason, I hadn't had breakfast. I skipped breakfast because I really wanted to get on my way. And I thought, no problem. I'll get something when I get to this place and I'll head down to Bangkok. And as I said, it was a, it's a six hour drive back then. And, uh, I got there and they, I don't know why they were all closed. It wasn't, um, it could have been some sort of holiday, but my I was I did speak a little bit of Thai back then, but not as much as now, and um, I was hungry and I stopped. But there was a family of Thai people and they were eating and they I'd, I'd stopped the car, I got out and I went to each one of these and thought 
they're closed, you know, what am I going to do now? And obviously the Thai family put two and two together and they, and they were eating on, the, on a mat on the, on the grass and they called me over and they said, look, why don't you join us? They didn't say it like this, but I'm just explaining it to you. They said, why don't you join us and you, you can eat with us? And being a bit shy, I was like, oh no, it's fine. I had a big breakfast and I can wait till I get to Bangkok. But they, they insisted and I sat down with them and I had some rice and some fried egg and some fish and you know, this went on and you feel kind of, you don't want to be rude. So I wanted, after I'd eaten, I wanted to get up and go, but they're talking and they're learning, you know, they're, they're sort of asking you questions about where you come from and all sorts of things that they, you know, maybe they didn't have an opportunity to meet a foreigner before. Um, but they, I couldn't just get up and go. It would have been rude. So I stayed and then, you know, the inevitable happened, didn't it? The bottle of whiskey came out, the Thai whiskey. I really didn't want to drink and there was no way I was going to drink and drive, but you know, um, I made a video on how not to do this. Don't become an alcoholic in Thailand. But anyway, um, these nice people, had, you know, they'd, made, they'd had a meal. I'd had a meal with them and the Thai whiskey, I didn't want to offend them and I did have it. And I thought, right, this is a one-off. And it kept going, it kept going, it kept going. And in the end, I ended up sleeping all night in my car in this little kind of pit stop. And uh, when I woke up, they were gone, obviously. So whether I got drunk and they put me in the car or I crawled to the car, I don't know. Um, but quite a nice memory just for the very fact of having a, a meal with a, a Thai family and um, you know kind of being the center of attention okay guys so I hope that's um, you know I hope that they're, they're, them 20 experiences of mine haven't sent you to sleep yet and um, you did ask me and like I said I've got thousands and thousands of good memories a few bad memories from Thailand and I don't know why these 20 particularly stand out but they do I've now shared them with you so that's done and dusted job done okay next week as I say it's not going to be a relationship story again we'll do that the following week uh, I'm going to be putting this montage of pictures together which is going to be quite a lot of work because I'm going to give you each person a name uh, a name check so uh, each picture will will sort of say this is uh, courtesy of whoever sent it in and if you have sent me a picture you don't want your name on there you better let me know now before uh, next Monday okay guys once again thanks for joining me and I'll catch you next Saturday